Section twenty one of The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eighteen A Flood of Sunshine. Arthur Dimsdale gazed into Hester's face with a look in which hope and joy shone out indeed, but with fear betwixt them, and a kind of horror at her boldness, who had spoken what he vaguely hinted at, but dared not speak. But Hester Prynne, with a mind of native courage and activity, and for so long a period not merely estranged but outlawed from society, had habituated herself to such latitude of speculation as was altogether foreign to the clergyman. She had wandered, without rule or guidance, in a moral wilderness, as vast, as intricate and shadowy, as the untamed forest, amid the gloom of which they were now holding a colloquy that was to decide their fate. Her intellect and heart had their home, as it were, in desert places, where she roamed as freely as the wild Indian in his woods. For years past she had looked from this estranged point of view at human institutions, and whatever priests or legislators had established, criticising all with hardly more reverence than the Indian would feel for the clerical band, the judicial robe, the pillory, the gallows, the fireside, or the church. The tendency of her fate and fortunes had been to set her free. The scarlet letter was her passport into regions where other women dared not tread. Shame, despair, solitude—these had been her teachers, stern and wild ones, and they had made her strong, but taught her much amiss. The minister, on the other hand, had never gone through an experience calculated to lead him beyond the scope of generally received laws, although, in a single instance, he had so fearfully transgressed one of the most sacred of them. But this had been a sin of passion, not of principle, nor even purpose. Since that wretched epoch he had watched, with morbid zeal and minuteness, not his acts, for those it was easy to arrange, but each breath of emotion and his every thought. At the head of the social system, as the clergyman of that day stood, he was only the more trammelled by its regulations, its principles, and even its prejudices. As a priest, the framework of his order inevitably hemmed him in. As a man who had once sinned, but who kept his conscience all alive and painfully sensitive by the fretting of an unhealed wound, he might have been supposed safer within the line of virtue than if he had never sinned at all. Thus we seem to see that, as regarded Hester Prynne, the whole seven years of outlaw and ignominy had been little other than a preparation for this very hour. But Arthur Dimsdale! Were such a man once more to fall, what plea could be urged in extenuation of his crime? None, unless it avail him somewhat, that he was broken down by long and exquisite suffering, that his mind was darkened and confused by the very remorse which harrowed it, that, between fleeing as an avowed criminal and remaining as a hypocrite, conscience might find it hard to strike the balance. That it was human to avoid the peril of death and infamy, and the inscrutable machinations of an enemy that, finally, to this poor pilgrim, on his dreary and desert path, faint, sick, miserable, there appeared a glimpse of human affection and sympathy, a new life, and a true one, in exchange for the heavy doom which he was now expiating. And be the stern and sad truth spoken, that the breach which guilt has once made into the human soul is never, in this mortal state, repaired. It may be watched and guarded, so that the enemy shall not force his way again into the citadel, and might even, in his subsequent assaults, select some other avenue, in preference to that where he had formerly succeeded. But there is still the ruined wall, and near it the stealthy tread of the foe that would win over again his unforgotten triumph. The struggle, if there were one, need not be described. Let it suffice that the clergyman resolved to flee, and not alone. If, in all these past seven years, 
thought he, I could recall one instant of peace or hope I would yet endure for the sake of that earnest of heaven's mercy. But now, since I am irrevocably doomed, wherefore should I not snatch the solace allowed to the condemned culprit before his execution? Or, if this be the path to a better life, as Hester would persuade me, I surely give up no fairer prospect by pursuing it. Nor can I any longer live without her companionship, so powerful is she to sustain, so tender to soothe. O oh, thou, to whom I dare not lift mine eyes, wilt thou yet pardon me? Thou wilt go, said Hester calmly, as he met her glance. The decision once made, a glow of strange enjoyment threw its flickering brightness over the trouble of his breast. It was the exhilarating effect, upon a prisoner just escaped from the dungeon of his own heart, of breathing the wild, free atmosphere of an unredeemed, unchristianized, lawless region. His spirit rose, as it were, with a bound, and attained a nearer prospect of the sky than throughout all the misery which had kept him grovelling on the earth. Of a deeply religious temperament there was inevitably a tinge of the devotional in his mood. "'Do I feel joy again?' cried he, wondering at himself. "'Methought the germ of it was dead in me. O oh, Hester, thou art my better angel! I seem to have flung myself, sick, sin-stained and sorrow-blackened, down on these forest leaves, and to have risen up all made anew, and with new powers to glorify him that hath been merciful. This is already the better life. Why did we not find it sooner? Let us not look back, answered Hester Prune. The past is gone. Wherefore should we linger upon it now? See, with this symbol I undo it all, and make it as it had never been. So speaking, she undid the clasp that fastened the scarlet letter, and, taking it from her bosom, threw it to a distance among the withered leaves. The mystic token alighted on the hither verge of the stream. With a hand's breadth farther flight it would have fallen into the water, and have given the little brook another woe to carry onward, besides the unintelligible tale which it still kept murmuring about. But there lay the embroidered letter glittering like a lost jewel, which some ill-fated wanderer might pick up, and thenceforth be haunted by strange phantoms of guilt, sinkings of the heart, and unaccountable misfortune. The stigma gone, Hester heaved a long, deep sigh, in which the burden of shame and anguish departed from her spirit. Oh, exquisite relief! She had not known the weight until she felt the freedom. By another impulse she took off the formal cap that confined her hair, and down it fell upon her shoulders, dark and rich, with at once a shadow and a light in its abundance, and imparting the charm of softness to her features. There played around her mouth, and beamed out of her eyes, a radiant and tender smile that seemed gushing from the very heart of womanhood. A crimson flush was glowing on her cheek, that had been long so pale. Her sex, her youth, and the whole richness of her beauty came back from what men call the irrevocable past, and clustered themselves, with her maiden hope, and a happiness before unknown, within the magic circle of this hour. And, as if the gloom of the earth and sky had been but the effluence of these two mortal hearts, it vanished with their sorrow. All at once, as with a sudden smile of heaven, forth burst the sunshine, pouring a very flood into the obscure forest, gladdening each green leaf, transmuting the yellow fallen ones to gold, and gleaming adown the grey trunks of the solemn trees. The objects that had made a shadow hitherto embodied the brightness now. The course of the little brook might be traced by its merry gleam afar into the wood's heart of mystery which had become a mystery of joy. Such was the sympathy of nature, that wild, heathen nature of the forest, never subjugated by human law, nor illumined by higher truth, 
with the bliss of these two spirits. Love, whether newly born or aroused from a death-like slumber, must always create a sunshine, filling the heart so full of radiance that it overflows upon the outward world. Had the forest still kept its gloom, it would have been bright in Hester's eyes, and bright in Arthur Dimsdale's. Hester looked at him with the thrill of another joy. "'Thou must know Pearl,' said she. "'Our little Pearl. Thou hast seen her, yes, I know it, but thou wilt see her now with other eyes. She is a strange child, I hardly comprehend her, but thou wilt love her dearly as I do, and wilt advise me how to deal with her. Dost thou think the child will be glad to know me? asked the minister, somewhat uneasily. I have long shrunk from children, because they often show a distrust, a backwardness to be familiar with me. I have even been afraid of little Pearl. Ah, that was sad, answered the mother. But she will love thee dearly, and thou her. She is not far off. I will call her. Pearl! Pearl! I see the child, observed the minister. Yonder she is, standing in a streak of sunshine, a good way off on the other side of the brook. So thou thinkest the child will love me? Hester smiled, and again called to Pearl, who was visible at some distance, as the minister had described her, like a bright apparelled vision, in a sunbeam, which fell down upon her through an arch of boughs. The ray quivered to and fro, making her figure dim or distinct, now like a real child, now like a child's spirit, as the splendour went and came again. She heard her mother's voice, and approached slowly through the forest. Pearl had not found the hour pass wearisomely, while her mother sat talking with the clergyman. The great black forest, stern as it showed itself to those who brought the guilt and troubles of the world into its bosom, became the playmate of the lonely infant, as well as it knew how. Sombre as it was, it put on the kindest of its moods to welcome her. It offered her the partridge berries, the growth of the preceding autumn, but ripening only in the spring, and now red as drops of blood upon the withered leaves. These Pearl gathered, and was pleased with their wild flavour. The small denizens of the wilderness hardly took pains to move out of her path. A partridge, indeed, with a brood of ten behind her, ran forward threateningly, but soon repented of her fierceness, and clucked to her young ones not to be afraid. A pigeon, alone on a low branch, allowed Pearl to come beneath, and uttered a sound as much of greeting as alarm. A squirrel, from the lofty depths of his domestic tree, chattered, either in anger or merriment, for a squirrel is such a choleric and humorous little personage that it is hard to distinguish between his moods. So he chattered at the child, and flung down a nut upon her head. It was a last year's nut, and already gnawed by his sharp tooth. A fox, startled from his sleep by her light footstep on the leaves, looked inquisitively at Pearl, as if doubting whether it were better to steal off, or renew his nap on the same spot. A wolf, it is said, but here the tale has surely lapsed into the improbable, came up and smelt of Pearl's robe, and offered his savage head to be patted by her hand. The truth seems to be, however, that the mother forest, and these wild things which it nourished, all recognised a kindred wildness in the human child and she was gentler here than in the grassy margined streets of the settlement, or in her mother's cottage. The flowers appeared to know it, one and another whispered as she passed, Adorn thyself with me, thou beautiful child, adorn thyself with me. And, to please them, Pearl gathered the violets and anemones and columbines, and some twigs of the freshest green which the old trees held down before her eyes. With these she decorated her hair, and her young waist, and became a nymph-child, or an infant dryad, or whatever else was in closest sympathy with the antique wood. In such guise had Pearl adorned herself, when she heard her mother's voice, and came slowly back. Slowly, 
for she saw the clergyman. End of section 21